Dear Father in heaven, thank you so much. You have blessed us with such incredible light. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the spirit of prophecy. Thank you for the timeless counsel that you have given to us about health that helps us to be able to have strong minds and strong bodies so that we can understand. Thank you for the power of the Holy Spirit that will still come, that will still step down from his exalted position in the sanctuary above as a part of the eternal Godhead and will grant wisdom to your children today so we can see what goes on around us. Father in heaven, we pray for your spirit to hover over our meeting today to give us discernment to give us wisdom in this hour of so many voices. In Jesus' name, amen. So what does focus on the family? Vatican spokesman Joaquin Navarro, Robert Schuler, Paul Harvey, John Paul II, Billy Graham, and Lonnie Meloshenko, the speaker-director of the Voice of Prophecy. What do they all have in common? Deception. What's that? Deception. Deception. They all agree on something. They all agree on something. They all agree that the film that has taken America by storm and apparently is going to be soon in other countries, if it isn't already, they all agree that the movie The Passion by Mel Gibson is an accurate portrayal from a biblical perspective of the last 12 hours in the earthly life of Jesus Christ. You say, now wait a minute, Bill. You talked about that in Behind the Door Part 36. Well, since sharing Behind the Door Part 36... I have had dropped in my lap many reviews concerning the movie, The Passion. And because there's so many, what would we call them, heavyweights? So many important people, so many famous people who are declaring that this movie, The Passion, is so biblically based and so accurate, I think and I felt it was important that we go back and analyze if that indeed is true. If it is, then we, like them, can get on that bandwagon and say, indeed, this is a biblically accurate portrayal. Or, after analyzing the evidence, we can stand separate from them and say, I don't know what they're looking at, and I don't know what Bible they're reading, but I'm not standing with them. And I think it behooves us to analyze the evidence so that we can make our own decision. Focus on the family, Danae Dobson, the daughter of Dr. James Dobson. She and her family went to review the film, The Passion, 
And these were her words. I had the unique privilege of accompanying my family to Mel Gibson's studio to see a private screening of his film, The Passion. Many of you have probably heard about this portrayal of the last 12 hours in the earthly life of Jesus Christ. I can say that The Passion is the most beautiful, profound, accurate, disturbing, realistic, and bloody dis depiction of this story that I have ever seen. So according to Danae Dobson, the daughter of Dr. James Dobson, the passion is an accurate depiction of the final events of the life of Christ. According to the president of Focus on the Family, a man by the name of Don Hodel, Don Hodel stated that the passion is theologically accurate. Ted Haggard, the pastor of the New Life Church in Colorado Springs, Colorado, said, the movie conveys more accurately than any other film who Jesus was. Vatican spokesman Joaquin Navarro Valles said that the movie describes the historical events of the Passion according to the Gospel. Bill Heibel, Robert Schuller, and Paul Harvey are all on record stating that the Passion is an unprecedented, truthful reenactment of Christ's Passion. John Paul II, after viewing the film, was quoted as saying, the movie described the passion of Christ as it was. And Lonnie Meloshenko of the Voice of Prophecy on the Adventist News Network made this comment. The passion was a profoundly spiritual display, amazingly accurate. For the rest of this tape, as I share a few of the things from the movie The Passion, I'd like for you to make a decision. Whether you agree with these people or whether you disagree. The movie The Passion opens with Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus looks frightening. He is covered with some dark substance, either mud or grease, which is over his hair and his face. He looks as if he has just come out of a mud pit. The Gospels tell us that three times Jesus fell on his face and prayed to his Father. The Gospels tell us that Christ just came from the upper room and walked from the upper room out to the Garden of Gethsemane. Was Jesus covered with mud or grease according to the biblical account? You say, oh Bill, what, what kind of a big deal is that? Well, are we going to be accurate or not? Once Jesus rises from his praying in the Garden of Gethsemane, the soldiers and the priests capture him in the garden. 
They bind him with a heavy-duty chain suitable for anchoring sea vessels. And at that point in the movie, they immediately begin to beat on him. Is that found in your Bible? Is that an amazingly accurate gospel account of what happened to Christ in the Garden of Gethsemane? The Bible simply says in Mark 14, 46, and 53 that they laid hands on him and seized him and led Jesus to the high priest. And all the chief priests and elders were assembled. We haven't even reached the high priest's apartment yet where Jesus was tried. And we already have two very simple inaccuracies in the Passion. In the Garden of Gethsemane, the devil, who has a black cloak and a mime white face, appears to Christ in the Garden of Gethsemane. You say, well, there's no question that the devil tempted Christ in the Garden. The desire of ages brings that out. Indeed, the devil did tempt Christ. But in the depiction in the movie, a snake begins to crawl out of the nose of this caricature or this person that is playing the devil. Slowly the snake creeps toward Jesus and is almost ready to bite his head while he is bowed in prayer. But Jesus then stands up and crushes the serpent's head. I know of no place in the Gospels where we find a snake crawling out of a devil in the Garden of Gethsemane. Do you? As Jesus is then being dragged to the cross at Calvary, there is a frenzied riot that breaks out between Romans and Jews. And they're fighting wildly as Jesus is being dragged to Calvary. While the Romans and Jews are fighting in this riot, Jesus is being brutalized by both sides. Which gospel writer is that in? While Jesus is standing before Pilate, or while they're taking Christ to Pilate, the Pharisees throw Jesus off of a bridge, together with the huge chain and thick rope that are around him. As he is flung over the bridge and hits the ground below, of course, Christ is broken and beaten up. But then almost like one of those spongy figures that the children have, Jesus then just bounces up and is pulled on this chain up over this wall back to the top. Was that in Matthew? Which gospel was Focus on the Family reading from? Was 
where, where have we seen this in which biblical account where John Paul would say authoritatively to the billions of Catholic people that the movie It Is As It Was. As Judas leaves the hall of Caiaphas in the film, children are playing on the street and they begin to throw stones toward Judas while he is walking outside the city to hang himself. Not a big deal. But nevertheless, not a part of the historical record. In the movie, when Jesus dies and the great earthquake takes place, the temple begins to dismantle and to fall apart. Did the temple collapse at the crucifixion of Christ? When did the temp when was the temple destroyed? 70 AD. It was destroyed in 70 AD by Titus and the Roman army. But in the accurate film by Mel Gibson according to Focus on the Family and Robert Schuller and Paul Harvey and Billy Graham and John Paul and Lonnie Melashenko in this amazingly accurate portrayal they have historically put the collapsing of the temple about 39 years ahead of time. In the episode of the carrying of the cross, in the movie, Mel Gibson has Simon of Cyrene and Jesus carrying the cross together. Is that what happened in the gospel story? Jesus was able to take the cross a certain distance and then because of his emaciated, the way he felt, the pain he was suffering, Jesus collapsed beneath the weight of the cross and it was then put on the shoulders of Simon of Cyrene. Probably the most inaccurate thing in the entire movie of the Passion has to do with the fact that the Virgin Mary throughout the film is seen in one episode after another where the gospel account never puts her at all. The only time that you will find Mary mentioned in the Gospels concerning the closing scenes of Jesus' life is at the foot of the cross when Jesus looked down and said, Woman, behold your son. And then to John the Beloved, he said, Son, behold your mother. 
That is the only time Mary is depicted in the gospel account of the sufferings and crucifixion of Christ. In the movie, The Passion, Mary is found in every major episode. She is dressed like a medieval nun rather than a first century Jewish woman. In another account in the film, she meets Peter on the streets after he denies Christ. Peter, in his distress, looks at Mary, falls down on his knees, and guess what he asks her? Peter asks Mary to forgive him. And so what is the point that Roman Catholic Mel Gibson, what point is he trying to make there? If Mary can forgive, then what does Mary become? She becomes a redeemer or a savior, and she also is a mediator. Can somebody tell me where in the Gospels that we find Peter asking Mary for forgiveness? Can somebody show me in their Bible where it is? But all of these great men from all of these great organizations from focus on the family to the rest of the story, to Crystal Cathedral, to the Vatican, to the voice of prophecy, they're all telling us that this movie is amazingly accurate to the biblical record. Mary is ready to absolve Peter for his sin in the film. But then Peter jumps up and says, no, I'm not worthy. And he runs away. Pilate's efforts are too little and too late. Did Mary and Claudia have an interview in the scriptures? As Jesus goes along the Via Della Rosa, or the way of suffering to Golgotha, he stops several times because he has no strength left to go on. And at these points in the film, Guess who is always near Christ, acting as his comforter and his coach? Guess who it is? The Virgin Mary. When Jesus hangs on the cross in the movie, covered with blood, Mary embraces his bloody feet and her face is splattered with blood as well. So according to Catholic producer Mel Gibson, it's not only Jesus that's bleeding at the cross, but Mary is bleeding as well, standing next to him, covered with blood. So who's the Redeemer? Who's the Savior in the Passion? There's two Redeemers in the Passion. Jesus and Mary.
as they go through the streets on the way to the cross. Jesus falls down under the weight of the cross. And at that point in the movie, there's a flashback to when Jesus as a boy fell on a street in Jerusalem. And his mother comes running out of the house to pick him up. The interplay of Mary and Jesus in this film is moving and reaches its apex in this scene. When they get to the cross, in the movie The Passion, Mary actually states in the film to Jesus let me die with you biblically based Accurate to the historical record, amazingly accurate, theologically correct. It is as it was. Did Mary say in the Gospels, let me die with you? You say, Bill, it doesn't matter if Jesus' hair was greasy or looked muddy in Gethsemane in the film. That's pithy. That's little stuff. And you know what? I could say, yeah, it's not real significant. But folk, when evangelicals and Seventh-day Adventist leaders announce that the movie is amazingly accurate, a profound spiritual display, and Mary is glorified as a redeemer, as a savior, I have trouble with that. And I refuse to stand with people who will say that it's accurate. That's, quite frankly, that's insanity. Gibson puts Mary at nearly all the events of his trial, torture, and crucifixion. Even has Mary kissing Jesus' feet when he's at the cross. There are many scenes like that one not biblical, but based upon mystic, apocryphal writings and Catholic traditions. I took notes of the non-biblical scenes, events, and characters and had a full page of them. The danger is that this film will become like Oliver Stone's JFK of the crucifixion. That is, that the public will think that Mel Gibson's account is truly biblical and historical. Billy Graham said that every time I preach or speak about the cross, the things I saw in that film will be on my heart and my mind. The flogging of Jesus in the film goes on and on. Jesus seems to encourage it when he pulls himself up and stands defiantly against them after the first round of beatings. 
But as several characters begin to find the violence so unbearable that they have to look away, so does Mel Gibson. His camera follows Jesus' mother Mary as she retreats to another room where she tries to cope with the cries of pain that she can still hear. We have some strange uh, characters here that are uniting together. We have the beast in the papacy. We have his image in apostate Protestantism. And we have another group that enters the unity process and that's a loud spokesperson for nominal Seventh-day Adventism in Lonnie Melishenko. You say, oh, but Bill, that's just a movie. It's not a big deal. Well, if it wasn't a big deal, folks, then the Catholic Church wouldn't be urging the planet and billions of people to be sure to watch it. Very interesting that these strange bedfellows, the beast is image and nominal Adventism, right now uniting on a film called The Passion by Mel Gibson. One day soon they'll unite on another issue. They'll unite on another issue. And this one will have consequences that are as far reaching as eternity. And it's called Sunday. Because sometime in the near future, and this is just a warm-up, sometime in the near future when Sunday laws are urged upon all the people of this nation, you can be sure that the likes of Billy Graham and Robert Schuller and Focus on the Family and Paul Harvey and Lonnie Melishenko are going to urge their people to keep the first day of the week. May God help us. May God help us to have spiritual insight, to discern truth from error, and to stand in defense of truth and righteousness when the majority forsake us. Let us pray. Loving Father in heaven, in light of the evidence, in light of what is depicted in this film, The Passion, it is blatantly obvious that it is totally and almost completely unbiblical. That so many things have been brought in through Catholic mysticism that have no basis in the scriptures. And yet, Father, in that light, so many profound and big people are saying that it's biblically accurate. That's nothing short of insanity. That's nothing short of being crazy. Dear Father, please, if it's possible, please, shed light into those people's minds 
before they take a step from which they can't turn around. They are heading towards eternal separation from you. Please send those men light. This is unbelievable. It's shocking. Please. Please send the Holy Spirit to help those people, to help Lonnie Meloshenko. What is he doing? Has he lost his mind? Please help him. Please help all these men before they go to eternal damnation, before they die in the lake of fire. Please help them. Please send a message to them. Please help them and help us to be of help to others. In Jesus' name, amen. Does anybody have any questions? Connie? David, can you get the mic to her? Thanks, David. I have two. The first one is simple. It's just like uh, the modern... Jesus was sweating and would, you know, fell on, on the dirt. He could have had some mud. I mean, they have everything else, but for these, these are these are speculations that people added. There was no mud. I mean, this is something. The more you read the gospel, in the end, you can see he fell, and of course, that's, that's a possibility. But the Bible does not do anything about it. What? What I'm seeing after you have this is how uh, the same thing that we were in the great controversy, before they brought the Sunday worship, things were coming gradually until Sunday became, I mean, really steady. So this is coming slowly. Uh, last term, because, you know, we have, we have term in Advent, Seventh Adventist, Thirteen Sabbath, Last term was studying the Gospel of John. So in, I happened to teach the lesson when they had asked me to Sabbath school when the guy Puller was going studying that church in Apopka. Mm -hmm. So I was doing the Sabbath school and they, when I was saying, doing the lesson, there's one section in the lesson where it was clearly uh, said as the commentary. Right? Jesus uh, was a little bit revolting against the abuse because when he said to these people, why, if I, when he was talking to Caiaphas or Anna, somebody hit him, right. they said, well, why did you hit him? I mean, and he said, don't you know you shouldn't talk like this too? So they thought Jesus didn't want the abuse when he said what he said. And I, I remember I said to the class, uh, if uh, I don't agree with this at all, because if Jesus was revolting against any abuse, he would have revolted against being crucified. So, in other words, even in our church, the, this is being added, even in the quarterly. So, we're saying the people Jesus is again saying something against the abuse, and that lesson felt, I mean, just finished right with the passion. I mean, the whole book of John ended, I mean, the last month ended with, of course, the Passion of Christ, which mm -hmm. ended with that particular film. So I had at least the opportunity to tell that class where all these people were there. So, and I asked them, if, the, if anyone is in disagreement with what I said, tell, say it clearly. But everybody agreed with me that that was wrong. I mean, that, they didn't say it in the Bible. And this was not really an abuse. Jesus was not revolting against abuse. Hmm. So uh, this is we have to expect something like this to happen, even in the Seventh Day Adventists, even in the Quarterlies. It's less on everything is 90 percent right, but there is always one or two percent, or even 0 0.5 percent, which is not right, which creates a doubt in people's mind. 
And as you said, I didn't know we had so much of Mary in that film. So I appreciate, really appreciate that. You know, the interesting thing, Connie, with this film, for, for people to say that it's accurate, from what I'm picking, I, had, I think I had around 12 to 15 things that I mentioned. I was numbering them as we went along. To, and then to have Mary running through the entire film. The only thing that's really accurate is that Jesus did suffer. Now the extent to which they play it out in the film is very exaggerated. And there's a purpose for that. Because when you stun people... You know, I've read many things where people have said when they come out... Uh, they say, oh, everybody was silent, or their people were crying. Well, when a person is stunned, when you're stunned, you know, you go, you can't talk. You can't. And Mel Gibson is a master of using violence on the screen. And so he so stunned people by that movie that you know all these things that go on that we talked about here, the role of Mary, Mary saying, let me die with you, Mary pleading with Pilate. I have asked probably three or four people, Did you, do you remember those parts You know that I quoted? They said, oh no, that didn't happen. And I'm going, you know, the person who's, who's reporting, you know, the various sources I got, either they're lying, which I don't think they are, or the people who saw that film and watched the bloodshed and the violence for over two hours, they are so stunned by that that so much of it, it just passes right on by and they don't even realize it. What's that? See, and that, that, is the, that is the most frightening thing because what we have is that goes right into the subconscious and, and everybody empathizes with Mary and says, oh, oh, it must have hurt. She's the mother, you know. So you gain this sympathy for this woman and one day soon when we have the manifestation of demons in this world masquerading as the apostles and as Mary. What is the world going to do? They've got those thoughts in their mind. Oh, Mary is such a wonderful person. And then they see the demon Mary dressed as an angel. As an angel. She's not going to come as some grotesque looking figure. She is going to be beautiful and she is going to say oh my my children my son has told me that we should now honor him and me by honoring Sunday and what are people going to do who have in their mind Mary so wonderful they're going to say oh yes that's what we must do and it's going to take this world like a storm. And Seventh-day Adventists look at it and say, Oh, it's okay. We can go watch the movie. It's not going to hurt us. Oh, yes, it will. Faye, I'll tell you. I have not talked with a lot of people. But um, I, I could have quoted other people in this, in this article. William Johnson, editor of the Adventist Review. It's scary. It's scary. Absolutely, Faye. And see, this... We're, we're at the point where people are making decisions. And we've said this for so many years, but 
people are making decisions that will soon be it's like a child's hand you know when you got wet cement they put their hand in the cement and they pull it out and the impression is there and it's not gonna it's not gonna change it's not gonna change for eternity for eternity David I was wanting to get those two Catholic I guess you could call them saints that you said were basically the uh, co-contributors here on the movie along with supposedly what came out of the Bible. What, what were their names again? The first, the first lady's name, David, was uh, Mary of Agreda. Agreda's A-G-R-A-D-A, um, Mary of Agreda. Uh, she was, what's that? Just one D, just one D. Mary of Agreda. She was a Catholic mystic, David, um, wrote in the 17th century, right around uh, 1635, 1640. Um, she wrote the book, uh, The City of God, which is about the life of the Virgin Mary. And she has been quoted, David, and I've read it um, Mary of Agreda has stated that she received this information from the Virgin Mary. So translated, she received it from a demon. She channeled the... Uh, exactly. Channeled. The, other, the other lady's name, David, was Anne Catherine, Anne Catherine Emmerich. Emmerich is spelled E. M M E R I C H Anne Catherine Emmerich. Anne Catherine Emmerich lived in the late 1700s into the early 1800s, I believe. Let me just double check that. Um, Anne Catherine Emmerich also said, yes, yeah, she, she was born 1774, died 1824. So she died three years before the birth of Ellen Harmon. Um, Anne Catherine Emmerich wrote four volumes, David, huge volumes. They're basically like the Conflict of the Ages series. And uh, she stated that she received the information from the Virgin Mary. So those are the two women. Uh -huh. well, that's, that's what I wanted to have. So, Charlotte, please. Is it true that Gibson plans a series to follow this movie and carry through all these? I've heard that he plans it. I don't know, Charlotte. I, it's not, it stands to reason that he would, but I don't know for certain. I don't know, Charlotte. I, I can only say this, Charlotte. The first one is steeped in Catholic spiritualism that is, is bringing people to a place where they will reject the truth for this time. Any other subsequent film of Mel Gibson, um, I would guess Charlotte, um, if he did make others, would probably be in a similar vein and would lead to... Um, well, he's already got people in that mode of, of accepting Mary and then he'll fall. I, I, I believe he'll follow through with more. Oh, probably he will. Now, I will, will say one thing. Um, I think I think it's uh, good. Uh, the book that Sharita showed this morning, which had just those last chapters in Desire of Ages, it's a good thing to share that with people. You know, uh, put out by Remnant Publications. Um, so I think that uh, that book, you know, of course, I mean. The Desire of Ages, that's a great book. So, anyway, that looks like it'd be good. Janie, please. 
There's also a book called The Appearing. I don't know if it's going to be a movie, too, and some other movie that uh, alleges that um, Mary had Jesus' baby. And if the Pope puts his blessing on these movies, two people will take it as gospel. And they will never check to see the true story. They'll just believe what they see on TV or read. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, that's by Tim LaHaye, I think. They think they, they think they know it all and they think what they're doing is right, but they, they need to go back and read the Bible because Absolutely why don't they buy the Bible instead of buying this book? Um, you know, but it's amazing. The lines were so long. I saw it on the news. Really? For this? Okay. Well. You know, Bill, that, uh, I think that a lot of the big percentage of the people that uh, saw that, that movie and thought it was... Uh, uh, wonderful and, and and so forth like this here. I don't even think they uh, open their Bibles. If they did, they wouldn't they wouldn't be saying that. Well, see, Jim, that that's the thing. That's what what do you do? Because you know all these folks, Jim, the the vast majority of people that go who don't read their Bibles and think it's wonderful. But Jim, when you get a guy like Lonnie Melishenko. I'm sitting here, I'm saying, what, what is that guy thinking about? I believe, Connie, he's, he's Russian, isn't he? I believe he is. Charlotte. I think what bothers me most is that subconsciously these people have been affected and yet they're not aware of it and yet as they go on, uh, let's say series, and getting more and more and more of this, you know, it, it's mind control. It's really mind control. It's, um, it's very scary, Charlotte. It's very scary. Very scary. It's just scary. Chuck, please. You know, uh, I get in a war with Connie over this. I, you know, I think we're... And don't take me wrong. No, go ahead. I I look at this as another tool for our evangelism. Many movies have come out on the life and death of Jesus Christ. We've had the movie Ten Commandments, and we know they were not completely biblical. They were changed. It was a Hollywood production. Now, I look at it that God's well in control of this situation. Not only, Connie talked about the study of John, but in that study, in, in that quarterly, it gets the power of his resurrection, which has been immensely deep with me. I've gone in and I've dragged out things from the Bible and the spirit of prophecy saying about his power of the resurrection. What is this power of the resurrection? And I listened to a, uh, a news commentator, and he talked about this. I've got no desire to see it I don't I don't want even I hate to even talk about it because we're giving Satan free publicity and I, I heard this man said if and he had interviews with people that come out of seeing this movie and he says there was one word one word that came out of this was the word you know what word I, I, would, I would talk about not sure sir. faith people have been led probably to Christ by this movie but sooner or later, they are going to start reading their Bible, the same as the Sabbath. It's a seed. When you go out, you talk about the Sabbath. Oh, I didn't, your books. Oh, I didn't know about this. I read the Bible. Mission stories I read from quarterlies that they start reading about uh, in the Bible, and they found out about the Sabbath. I think this is the way it's going to be. I'm not concerned about that movie. It's not biblical, but so every, every other thing, even in our own church, People are saying things that aren't biblical. So I'm looking at this bill as another tool of evangelism. And God is in control. And then when Sharita says about this book today, that just tied it up for me. I say God is bringing things out. He brought this study out of power of his resurrection. The same, almost the same time that this movie had come on the market. God is well in control of the situation. And those people that are going to be 
lost are going to be lost. But I think when people start realizing or being led to Jesus and start studying about Jesus, they're going to find out that this wasn't true. Mary didn't say this. Mary didn't act big in the Bible that they're portraying. So I'm not concerned about this. I'm concerned about giving, giving undue uh, uh, time to Satan and his evil spirits. Because I think God is in control of this. And it come out at the same, at, at this time of our life and the end days, where you're going to be either driven one way or the other. And I think if the Holy Spirit is in people, they're going to see what this picture is.